Hello and welcome to this episode of WorldWise. I am here in computer spirit with uh, Brendan O'Kane, translator and blogger at Rectified.name, who's lived in China for 10 years. And we are going to talk today about the 30th anniversary of the Chinese Spring Festival, Festival Gala show, um, probably the most watched show in history outside of sports, and just a terrible piece of work. Um, so if this show is so horrifically bad, um, how have billions of people watched it over the last 30 years? Well, for one thing, imagine 1983. You know, the, the pickings are fairly slim, uh, content-wise. Uh, it, it established itself just by dint of being pretty much the only thing going. And it's kept going ever since because, you know, even today with a, a slightly more diverse uh, media market in China, CCTV is still the, you know, the 10,000 pound gorilla on steroids in the room. Um, it also so happened that it was the only thing going on Chinese New Year's Eve. Uh, regional broadcasters have their own galas, but they don't air on New Year's Eve, they air on New Year's Day or the day after, they're being staggered throughout the week. So it's kind of the only show in town. Yeah, so give us a little background on what goes on in China during Chinese New Year for people who have not had the opportunity to be surrounded by the firework war zone in person. Well, you get fireworks, obviously. That'll be familiar to anybody who's, you know, lives in a, a major city with a Chinatown. Um, but if you're in Beijing or Shanghai or, or another major city, what you notice is that it turns into a ghost town. Um, people go home for New Year's. It's like Christmas and Thanksgiving rolled into one times 1.3 billion. Um, and so for cities like Beijing and Shanghai, where a lot of the population is not originally from there, you just see people streaming out of the city en masse. It's the largest human migration I in history. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the Chunyuan, the, the migration figures were this year, but you go out on the street in Beijing and it's deserted. And by deserted, I mean it's got about the same amount of foot traffic as Philadelphia. Um, so, so that's one thing. People go home, they sit down with their families, they eat a massive meal, they drink too much, they make jiaozi, the, the delicious dumplings. And they sit around on the couch and they have this CCTV gala on in the background. And what, so I mean, you know, throughout the year, is anyone looking forward to watching the gala? I mean, is this something that people get excited about? Is there jockeying over who's going to be on, who's not going to be on? I mean, is there an industry around this or is this just noise watched by 800 million or a billion people? Uh, somewhere in between. Uh, it's the show that everybody loves to hate. Uh, almost in the same way that uh, after the Oscars in the U.S., everybody talks about what a terrible job the host did. Uh, you know, everybody complains about the Chunwan, the, the gala. It's just, it's kind of a national sport. Uh, actually, on Weibo, the sort of Chinese Twitter analog, the uh, top tag at the moment is Chunwan Tutsal, which is just uh, griping about the gala. Um, that said, people do look forward to it because it's it's a thing in sort of the same way that, uh, you know, Dick Clark's New Year's Eve special on American TV is manifestly not the hippest thing going. It's still kind of an institution. Uh, it does get a lot of big acts. There are, you know, big performers, movie stars, uh, singers, and people, they might not admit it, but they do tend to look forward to this stuff. Hmm. So what was your experience like watching it this year? Can you tell us a little about that? Well, uh, it's, it's a thing. Um, I was with my wife's family and my in-laws at uh, their compound in Beijing. So we, we sat down on the couch, we bust out some oranges, and we turned on the opening. The opening features this just stream of uh, CCTV hosts, that is, hosts from China Central Television, all of them wishing the audience a happy new year. And you get very elaborate song and dance routines. It's sort of like um, Ziegfeld Follies on crack. And, um, you know, our, our experience watching it was just the standard snark fest. I mean, Chinese audiences are, uh, 
not particularly forgiving when it comes to their celebrities, certainly no more than, than audiences anywhere else. And so we're sitting there and, uh, you know, so-and-so has put on weight, so-and-so has an awful voice, such and such a person is the most irritating host on CCTV, except for the next person, and so on and so forth. You get the whole stream of commentary about who's hot and who's not, and, and who's irritating and who's even more irritating. So call me old-fashioned, but I hear Yanni was on this year, and I can't even think of anything that someone would say to be snarky about Yanni. I mean, how did people get around that? Uh, I, I contrived to miss Yanni's performance. I, I was walking back from my in-laws' compound, so uh, I, I guess I'll never know. Um, if I ever feel like inflicting pain upon myself, the video will live forever on, on video streaming sites like Yoku and, and uh, Twido. But, uh, yeah. Uh, going by the program listing, it was a piano and guzheng uh, duet. And what's a guzheng? A uh, guzheng, uh, other audiences might know it as a, a koto. It's just a long stringed uh, zither instrument. Uh, lovely sound, uh, much like that piano. In the right hands, it, it's a beautiful instrument. I'm not sure what happens and in Yanni's hand. So how is it, I mean, I always remember hearing Kenny G uh, piped through trains uh, at six in the morning, which is definitely the way that I wanted to wake up. I mean, how is it that people like Kenny G, like Yanni, have lived on in Beijing? I mean, what are your What are your thoughts on that? Um, I think partly these things just don't have the association that they would for American audiences. You know, we hear Kenny G, and it takes us back immediately to that time we got stuck in an elevator or the time we were on hold for 45 minutes, or, you know, whatever. Uh, for Chinese audiences, it's it's just music, and, and they don't have the unpleasant mental associations. Uh, it's certainly not to say that everybody likes this stuff. Plenty of people don't. But it just kind of comes in, as with uh, other genres of music, kind of context-free. And so you'll get people who listen to punk music and are also fans of the Carpenters. I don't quite get it, but it's common. Wow. And so this was the first year, I think I think you were telling me before, that they had such a big-named foreign guest in the figure of Celine Dion. How was that? That was remarkable. Um, so first off, Celine Dion and the uh, the PLA Chanteuse Song Zuying came out and performed a duet, Jasmine Flowers, uh, which is kind of unavoidable in the context of these international pairings. Uh, Jasmine Flowers, uh, a traditional Chinese folk song, Hao Duo Mei Li De Mo Li Huar, uh, adapted by Puccini and Turando. Uh, so Song Zu Ying came out and sang, Celine Dion came out and sang in Mandarin, actually in pretty decent Mandarin. And then naturally it segued into My Heart Will Go On, which went on. And <laughs> and how was the snark level at your house when that happened? Was this something that your family appreciated as just music and just soundtrack to the Titanic, or was it something that they had heard 1,400 times and didn't particularly want to hear again? Well, by that time, uh, we'd gotten back to, uh, my, my wife and I had gotten back to our house. We had a couple of friends over, and uh, it, it, was, it was a tougher room, uh, you might say. Um, but, hey, Titanic is huge here. My heart will go on, continues again to go on in China. And, um, you know, Celine Dion, not the hippest act, but she's she's got a fan base somewhere. Hmm. I remember I bought a copy of Titanic in, in China. I think it was 8 Kwai, and it was spelled Titanic. Yes. Um, so I don't know if that was a director's cut, but I never ended up seeing it. So... I wanted to ask you as well, you mentioned uh, PLA songstress. Right. So what's the story with the military singers? Well, the, the People's Liberation Army, or, or PLA, has got its own arts troops. So in addition to the soldiers who are trained to kill things, you get people who are trained to sing and dance and perform in unison. Um, there are also uh, is a People's Literature Army Academy of Literature, the, the Lushun Academy. Uh, which has produced people including uh, Moyen, the, this year's Nobel Prize winner. Um, Sun Zing, to the best of my knowledge, does not have actual military military training. Uh, 
but uh, she's she's associated with these guys. Um, she's also widely rumored, which is to say, acknowledged to be the mistress of Jiang Zemin. Um, and uh, the it, former president of China. The former, yes. And uh, in fact, during the uh, during the Chunwan, Michael Anti, a Chinese uh, commentator and and uh, all around funny guy sort of made a half-serious speculation that the pairing of Song Zuying and Celine Dion was some kind of, the fulfillment of some kind of fantasy on the part of Jiang Zemin, who is known to be a huge fan of Titanic. Wow. Yeah. So also, isn't uh, the current president, or the current chairman of the Communist Party, his wife is a PLA singer. Um, yes. Was she involved in this year's uh, spectacle at all? Uh, no. No. She has, as far as I know, been keeping a fairly low profile. Uh, but she's she's known uh, quite widely uh, as a performer. Um, before Xi Jinping's ascension, in fact, she was probably much better known than he was. So when you're sitting there watching this show, what, what parts are enjoyable? I mean, what do you see and, and you know, what does your family see where you say, hey, that's actually pretty good? Well, every year there's at least one uh, acrobatic routine. Usually there are several. Um, and they're really fantastic. You sort of watch it and, and uh, you know, cringe in pain throughout. Uh, almost always a, a pairing of a man and a woman. And, uh, you know, this year's was just really remarkable. Uh, they're, they're always remarkable. China, not a slouch in the acrobatics department. Um, I happen to like some of the, the uh, comedy routines. Not the sketches. Those are usually pretty dismal. Uh, but uh, Xiangsheng. This year, Guo Degang, who's a very well-known Xiangsheng performer, came on. And this is something that, you know, to, to people who were raised as I was on a diet of, you know, George Carlin and Richard Pryor, this stuff is pretty tame. But uh, within the, the confines of, you know, Chinese state media and within the tradition of Chinese comedy, uh, Guo Degang's actually very funny. You know, this routine, it's very much like an old vaudeville routine. One guy is the, the straight man, the other guy is the fast-talking comedian, and uh, they just sort of do a back-and-forth routine, which tends to grow increasingly uh, absurd as the routine progresses. Uh, Guo Degang was on... So, sorry. Oh, I was just, just going to say, I mean, is there anything... You mentioned George Carlin, uh, Richard Pryor, and these being tame. Is there anything even resembling a dirty joke or a risque joke on this show, or do you have to go to smaller shows, or, I mean... Any, you know, yeah. anything gasp-worthy besides um, the acrobatics? There actually was one gasp-worthy moment. It's, it's become the hot topic. Every year there's one kind of, uh, you know, teapot tempest after the, the CCTV gala. This year the Taiwanese magician Liu Qian came on and did a routine with Li Yundi, uh, a, a piano player. And in the course of the patter for the routine, he alluded to these uh, widespread rumors that Li Yundi is involved in a gay relationship with Wang Lihong, uh, a pop star. Uh, and, you know, he, he dropped this not terribly subtle reference, but you could see how it would get, get past the censors. He just says, you're looking for somebody? You're looking for Li Hong? The audience dutifully goes, ooh. Um, that line has been cut from the CCTV rebroadcast, and there is now some back and forth online about whether it was scripted as part of the original routine, as Liu Qian says it was, or whether he ad-libbed it as CCTV says it was. Hmm. So how does censorship work in the program? So it's broadcast live, and therefore people are a little more careful, but when they rebroadcast it to how many people, then they cut it out? I mean, how, do, how does that process work? Well, for one thing, before the show ever goes on, you have months of preparation and scripting. Uh, a friend of mine actually took part in, in the CCTV gala years ago, and he's got this story about being in a, a comedic routine and just having it go past phalanx after phalanx of censors, uh, each one of them chipping away at it until finally really very little in the way of humor was left. So the entire thing is really quite mercilessly scrubbed before it ever even gets to rehearsal. Uh, then you have the rehearsal where further kinks are, are ironed out. Then you have the broadcast, which I, I'm not sure is probably done on a five second delay or something like that. And then you have the rebroadcast where any rough edges can be smoothed out. 
Wow. Sounds very milk toast. Yeah, it's, you know, the CCTV gala is like a microcosm of anything that happens on a national scale in China. You've got 1.3 billion people, you've got 56 ethnicities, you've got however many languages uh, in addition to Mandarin, and you have to come up with something that is going to disappoint everybody equally. Uh, so it ends so up being quite lowest common denominator. You mentioned the 56 uh, Chinese ethnicities, mm -hmm. and how do, how do they play a role in the Smith Festival Gala? I mean, I know, so China is 90% Han Chinese and 8% or so, 55 minorities who are cataloged and paraded out. Um, right. How does that, you know, kind of how does, how does the whole minority thing work in China? And, I mean, it's just so different from what we have here in the States. Yeah, in China, uh, the, the 1950s and 1960s never really happened in China, or at least not in the way they did in the U.S. And so people will really honestly think nothing of saying, as somebody did in Xinhua about a week ago, that uh, Uyghurs, for example, are genetically good dancers. Um, and so as a result, to the extent that there's any kind of participation by minorities in these shows, it's almost invariably in the singing and dancing category. Gotcha. So Uyghurs are a mostly Muslim minority living in northwest China, known uh, to many Chinese as being good dancers and, I guess, petty thieves, too. Is another, uh, another petty thieves, vendors of nut cake, uh, and they love to sing and dance all day, yes. So. I remember there was a Spring Festival Gala a couple of years ago where there was a song, I forget what the word was, but it was basically, it was Uyghur for, we're all a happy family? Uh, it was or, Uyghur for good, uh, Yakshi. For good. Yes. Uh, so the, you know, the party is Yakshi, the policies are Yakshi. Uh, for a while this actually became a theme on Yakshi, uh, became the, uh, the, the sarcastic word for, you know, anything good. Got you, got you. So speaking of good, or at least better than the main gala, I think you were telling me before that there's been provincial galas that have sprung up and that have been less creptacular. Can you tell me a bit, bit about those? Yeah, pretty much every uh, major satellite station has got its own Chinese New Year gala. Uh, Beijing TV had its, its gala last night. Um, Dragon TV had its gala the other night as well. And um, they compete not so much directly with CCTV because they're not airing in the same slot, but they compete for mindshare. So Dragon TV, which is run out of Shanghai, had Sai on, and he showed the audience how to do Gangnam style. Uh, surprise. Um, Beijing TV last night had Cui Jian on. Cui Jian, kind of a, a godfather figure in Chinese rock. I actually think Dragon TV may have had Celine Dion on as well. Somebody did. Um, hmm. Liaoning TV had uh, had Zhao Benshan on. Zhao Benshan is uh, normally a staple of the CCTV gala. He's a very popular uh, comedian from northeastern China. And this year he didn't appear on the gala. It's been rumored for years that he was just getting more and more fed up with the CCTV thing. And so uh, this year he was on Liaoning Weishir, Liaoning Satellite. Hmm. So Sai in China, has Sai been equally popular on TV and on computers in China? I mean, how, how is he a universal phenomenon? I, I mean, any he's, thoughts on that? He is pretty much unavoidable. Um, you know, memes memes like that know no geographical bounds. Um, everybody knows Gangnam Style. Uh, in fact, Ai Weiwei, the, the noted gadfly and uh, occasional dissident uh, recorded a video of himself dancing Gangnam Style, never one to let a meme pass him by. Um, there was a, a series of photographs after China unveiled its first aircraft carrier of people squatting down on the deck to, to usher a plane off, and uh, people photoshopped those up so that they appeared to be doing Gangnam Style on the deck of the aircraft carrier. It's just as unavoidable in China as it is everywhere else. Wow. 
So the size performance on, I think you said, what, Shanghai TV? Uh, uh, Dragon I mean, TV. How did that go? I mean, Dragon TV. Uh, how did that register on the Weibo's, uh, Weibo chattering classes irony meter? Uh, you know, he's, he's still got a ways to go in China. He may be sick of Gangnam Style, but uh, I think his audience here is still not entirely fed up with it. Hmm. Hmm. So if, uh, you know, for those listening at home, if someone wanted to get a introduction into the world of Chinese TV, I mean, are, are there shows that you have ever recommended to people? You know, sometimes people who speak Chinese, people who don't speak Chinese. Is there anything that is enjoyable on a, on a TV watching level? Well, the, it sort of depends what you're going for. Um, my favorite Chinese TV show is is really old. It's from the 90s, and it's called Bian Jibu de Gu Shi, uh, Stories from the Editing Room. And there's nothing all that special about it. It's a comedy. It's set in, in Beijing at the, the editing department of a magazine. But uh, it's just sort of a, a window into kind of life on the ground in, in Beijing. It, it's a very much a local sense of humor. For anybody who's studying the language uh, who is a fan of Beijing dialect, it's, it's just a treasure trove. Um, to the best of my knowledge, it, it's never been translated or, or subtitled or distributed abroad. In terms of more recent stuff, um, the really popular TV shows on China in China these days are either reality shows. Uh, there's The Voice of China, uh, which is the Chinese version of The Voice, uh, or these palace dramas, uh, none of which I can ever keep straight, but they're set during the you know, various imperial courts. So why are imperial dramas so popular in China? I mean, is it more than you know, just setting something in the past allows for social commentary that wouldn't be allowed in setting something in the present? I mean, is there just a big appetite for these things on an aesthetic level? Uh, I, I think a little of both. Uh, certainly, you can maybe push the ball a little further uh, if you're not dealing with something set in the present. But, um, you know, censorship is, is really being amped up across the board and has been for the past few years. I think part of it is uh, the, the, the romantic aspect of these things. Um, a couple of years ago, one of the big trends was uh, time traveling dramas where somebody from the present ends up in the past. Uh, think of it as sort of the Chinese version of uh, Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. Those were really popular until SARFT, the, the State Administration of Radio, Film, and Television, put its foot down and said, no more time traveling. Why? Um, it could lead to an improper view of history. Ooh. Yeah, it wouldn't work. Okay, that. that's, I, I understand. Mm. Uh, but seriously, why why time travel? Why was it popular, or why it did just, I mean, it, it just seems if you had to put yourself in the you know, in the censor's shoes, why? I mean, how arbitrary do you think that decision was? You know, why crack down on time travel but not palace dramas? I mean, is it that you know different people are paying off other people? Is it that these are seen as more spiritually polluting? Is it how do you read it? Um, I, I think there are probably a few aspects to it. Uh, it. It's important to note that palace dramas are also, they don't go unregulated. There's still very much the, uh, the rule that, um, you know, the, the official version of history, the official list of good guys and bad guys be maintained at all times. Uh, and that's true across the board, no matter what genre you're working in. So far as time travel goes, um, who knows? Partly uh, maybe worries about nostalgia, but in general, whenever the topic of censorship comes up, I just imagine some gray person of indeterminate gender, middle-aged, working in a windowless office, who just prays to themselves, or prays three times a day, you know, just whatever it is, don't let it be me, don't let it be my fault. It's a very conservative atmosphere. And there's really no upside to allowing things. It's much easier to deny permission. So how, in a system like that, has TV censorship gotten worse? I mean, why is it that as China grows wealthier and seems to, in other ways, open up to the world, TV shows 
become more and more feckless? Uh, hard to say. Uh, part of it, I think, is simply a, a, a reflexive reaction. Uh, there's the famous dictum that whenever you open the window, some flies are going to get in. I think the flies are, are an increasing concern. Um, if you look at some of the pronouncements that Xi Jinping has made, uh, you know, it, it's very clear that whatever else may change, uh, whatever reforms may be made, the, the tenet, the, the central tenet of all of these policies is the party stays in charge. There will be no threat to power, there will be no dissent rooked. And uh, as more and more channels for dissent or, or even slightly different opinions open up, I think there's uh, an increasingly strong reaction against those uh, and almost a, a reflexive brainstem level reaction that attempts to shut them down. You see that with Weibo, you see that with Tencent, uh, you see that across the board, certainly in, in publishing on blogs, microblogs, and on TV as well. Hmm. So, Brendan, you've worked as a literary translator and, and translated several books and articles. Um, how do you see that issue evolving in the publishing sphere? I mean, do you feel like there's more excellent Chinese literature being discovered? I mean, do you feel like it's not as strong as it was 10 years ago? What are your thoughts on that? Well, it's, uh, as always, it's, it's a messy picture. Um, there are small publishers who, who will take risks, who will publish things that uh, a bigger publisher wouldn't touch. Uh, we saw this with the blogger Li Changpeng recently. Um, Li Changpeng is known on the, the microblogging scene as sort of a really pretty acerbic viewer, uh, acerbic commentator on current events. Uh, he came out with a book, and uh, it, it made it into print with, uh, as far as I know, no edits, or at least a minimal number of edits, um, from a, a tiny little publishing house. Uh, generally speaking, though, in terms of literature, uh, there are some authors I look at, like Wang Xiaobo or, or Wang Shuo, who are doing stuff in the late 90s that could just never, ever be done today. Um, Wang Xiaobo, in particular, uh, just wrote these not direct criticisms of the government, but these almost Kurt Vonnegut-like uh, eh, quasi-satires set in the future, kind of couched in science fiction, but clearly talking about current events. And hmm. uh, I, I just, I don't think anybody would let him get away with that today if he were still alive. So how is he able, and I know this is a very complicated question, but you know, in as simple an answer as you can muster, I mean, how is he able to get away with it then if he couldn't get away with it now? In part, I think it was a more relaxed environment. Uh, uh, and in part, he, you know, he couched things in a certain way. So in one of his novellas, 2010, uh, he's writing in the mid-90s, it's a story that's set in the year 2010. So that al already gives him a little bit of wiggle room. Um, he sets it in the city of Beidaihe instead of Beijing. You know, there are all of these little distancing techniques that he uses. Uh, and it's also clearly uh, intended to be funny. Uh, but it's also a satire of contemporary official corruption, of pollution, of general incompetence. Um, these days, it's, I think it is a, a much tighter environment. Hmm. So for the last couple of minutes we have, let, let's get back to TV. What kind of American TV shows are popular? I mean, are people watching Breaking Bad, Archer, oh, yeah. Family Guy? Sure. Uh, this is actually kind of my home turf uh, as a translator. There are these groups like Feng Ran or Polan Xiong, of a lot of them are college students or grad students who will subtitle American TV shows and put the subtitles online for free. And they do this really, really fast. Within maybe 48 hours after a TV show airs in the US, it's been subtitled in Chinese. And the translations are frequently really good. Um, it's, it's all free, professional quality. My wife and I have been watching the second season of Homeland with Chinese subtitles. Breaking Bad is wow. being subtitled. 
Um, somebody's going back and doing the wire now as sort of a personal one-man project. I don't envy that translator. Um, wow. Yeah, pretty much anything you'd care to name, be it never so trashy. Uh, reality shows, of course, are huge. My wife is addicted to Survivor. So the uh, you know, the television companies behind, say, Breaking Bad, um, HBO, or, or, or whatnot, um, how much money are they seeing from Breaking Bad in China? Oh, to the best of my knowledge, they don't see a dime. So someone will see it online uh, or will buy a copy, rip it, put up subtitles, and put it on a Chinese file sharing site? Yeah, a lot of it gets shared over something like uh, Shunlei or... or uh... Uh, to a lesser extent, PPTV. A lot of the major video sharing sites have kind of cleaned up their acts uh, in preparation for IPOs or, or just for negotiating uh, with, with Hollywood companies for content rights. But uh, file sharing companies like Shinlei are still very much a free for all. Hmm. And do you know of any group of enterprising American bloggers who are taking CCTV Spring Festival and translating that into English and putting it up online for Americans to enjoy. Boy, you know, life is so short. I, I cannot think of anybody who would do that. Um, the stuff that is fun to watch is fun to watch if you already speak Chinese. But uh, like Guadagang, who I mentioned, a lot of it just wouldn't translate. Or if you translated it, it wouldn't be a big deal. Well, Brendan. Thanks for your time. Good to talk to you tonight. Thanks for having me. This has been an episode of Worldwise. I'm Isaac Stonefish in DC. It was Brendan O'Kane, translator and blogger at rectified.name in Beijing. Thanks for listening. Cheers. <laughs>